Thank you. Thank you. Well, as you imagine, I've done a, quite a number of M411, I guess we don't call it M anymore, it's EHS 411 now, uh, classes, and I really would appreciate it be interactive. Sometimes if you raise your hand, um, in it's the next slide I will say, let's hold off, but if the clarification, that sort of thing, please let me know. Uh, these are two of my books. This is the one I use when I taught here on the built environment and health, uh, EHS 208, and it was really a lot of fun and, and terrific students have come out of that. And I got going and working with um, the Luskin School when I was doing that. Actually, I have something to tell you. I actually was gonna show up late because I've been teaching at Berkeley a lot because I live in Berkeley and they start class at 10 minutes after the hour. So I'm dawdling along and suddenly, hey, you gotta hurry up. The, um, it is such a treat to be back at UCLA. Damn it, you're lucky. <laughs> you are in the most beautiful university and in my opinion, the best university in California. Um, and I really mean that, and there's a number of reasons, but I think this place reminds me of Bologna in the year 1500. Oh my God. What the hell is he talking about? B Bologna, Bologna was one of the first universities in the whole world. It was on a small physical area, and the philosophers were interacting with the doctors, who were interacting with the lawyers, who were interacting with Dante's descendants and literature. And I love the fact that at UCLA, when I was here, and I had an appointment in the medical school and in pediatrics, I could walk over there and be there in three minutes. I could walk to the nursing school, and I taught a lot in the nursing school, because, by the way, the nurses are the most trusted people in all of America, and I, we need to really stand them up, value them as they rightly deserve. I love the fact that I could go up to the law school, and we had a wonderful faculty member, and if you get a chance to do a class with Tim Malloy, who was a very senior person in the United States government, environmental stuff, uh, work with Tim, I also became an honorary architect because I worked hard to convince the American Institute of Architects and the uh, transportation engineers that they were major health leaders. So the fact that I could get anywhere, um, and pretty soon I'll need a cane too, Shane, but <laughs> uh, it really made this place, it gave it a critical mass and intensity that even Berkeley, it's, it's all spread out and you walk out in the cold and you trump through the wind and it takes a long time to connect people compared to UCLA and damn it's beautiful here. So enjoy yourself because it goes by fast and then you'll wish you were back here again. I started medical school this particular year. I eventually went to the University of California, San Francisco for med school. I was probably the only kid from Newark, New Jersey that went to a small Catholic college that ended up going to medical school in, at UCSF. Um, I probably got in because of a s couple of personality defects that I'll tell you about in a minute. But I remember well, of course, the day that the Armstrong walked on the moon. The population of Earth was only three and 0.6 billion people only. I'll come back to this later on, and this is the CO2 level of 324, by the way, right now it's 415. And this is the issue, but if I do this, I won't talk about anything. climate change, I won't do anything else. So, but I'm gonna come back to it because it's really relevant. I am not, you know, I know your generation doesn't like boomers because we're so greedy and we've stolen the whole planet, but the truth is that I'm not a boomer, I'm actually a war baby. And um, on December 7th was uh, the Pearl Harbor attack. On the next day, December 8th, Franklin Roosevelt got up in the House of Congress and said, asked for the declaration of war and unanimously it was done. On the very next day, Franklin D. Roosevelt called in the head of Ford, the head of GM, the head of Chrysler, the head of uh, the airline companies, the head of the transportation industry and said, you're not making anything for, civil for civilians any longer. No more cars, no more commercial aircraft, you're only building, building military. And so Ford went from you know, building millions of cars a year to nothing but tanks and other kinds of materials. Where I'm going with this will be, 
And really, uh, I said September 11th, that's an interesting slip. December 7th was a, t a flip in the American consciousness, like, oh my God, this is existential. We're in grave danger. On the very next day, this young man, he was 19 at the time, volunteered for the Air Force, because that was, and he wanted to be a fighter pilot. His name was uh, Bob Jackson, and eventually became, uh, got his, wings, I always look at this and can't believe this guy is a full lieutenant and f flying um, machines that, you know, this, one of this, this plane flew at 400 miles an hour, which is very fast for a prop aircraft. Uh, he crashed once. His uh, barracks were invaded when he was at Iwo Jima and half of the uh, pilots in the barracks were uh, killed in their uh, in the barracks during the war. Um, and he, obviously he wanted to get back and uh, he married his high school sweetheart, and they very quickly had three little boys. You'll have to guess which one is myself, but the relevance of the story will come very quickly. This guy could do 100 push-ups at a time at age 27. And one day he got up and he couldn't breathe. He was hitting the wall to get his breath. And my mother called the doctor and they ran him to the hospital there in Portland, Maine. He was running the tower, and airport tower in Maine, and he was dead in about 12 hours of polio, leaving my mother with three little boys. And, you know, I, I'm gonna tell you this, this, you know, why did I go into, pu public health is a vocation. It's not a job, it's a vocation. It's a way you discharge what is meaningful in your life. And I think after that, it was very hard for me to do anything that I didn't think was important. I, it wasn't necessarily I wanted to be important, but I didn't want to use my time on something that was unimportant. I didn't want to work for uh, the lawyers that were defending Exxon, for example, or, or these, a lot of these other issues. And, I, um, and we became we're basically working middle class before he died, and we became desperately poor um, people living in Newark, New Jersey during that whole time. My mother eventually remarried, but it was a very tough haul. Um, and in fact, I went in, I didn't know what to do, and back to vocation, the most impressive people in my life were the priests, and I actually um, went into the novitiate for the Society of Jesus, also called the Jesuits, and I studied, prayed three, four hours a day and studied philosophy and Latin and Greek and it was a wonderful two years, but it wasn't for me. I really needed to have the science mix and the ac action mix. But one of the things the Jesuits defined themselves as, and I love this, they called themselves contemplatives in action. Contemplatives, in other words, think deeply about who you are. Think deeply about what's important. Think deeply about ethics and truth. But then don't sit back and just think. You gotta then do something. And um, there was a rule uh, that came out of uh, the leaders in that, Ajay Quad Ajis. And I'll come back to this because I get a lot of, I'll tell you now, I get a lot of calls from people who are undergrads saying, I'm thinking about a career. I had a call just in the last two weeks from a young physician, um, actually, just finishing her medical school, and said, I love everything. You know, I, I don't know what to pick. I, you know, everything is so interesting to me, neurology and infectious disease and whatever. And I said, well, you know, in some ways it doesn't matter because you have to go deep early in your life and know something very well. And even though you might want to be broad and, I was state health director under Governor Schwarzenegger. I had about 5,000 people working for me. That's as broad as it gets. One, one second it's HIV, the next minute it's closing down nursing homes. But you can't get do this kind of stuff unless you appreciate what it's like to be deep in something. And I think that's one of the problems that George W. Bush had, and I think Trump has it too, which is he doesn't respect excellence. So when you spend five years learning microbiology and become an expert in uh, infectious diseases and you're now told to brief someone, that person needs to know that I need, I really need to listen. In fact, I tell this story, but one time I was on, when I was state health director under Schwarzenegger, I was asked um, by a really nasty guy on AM radio, he said, Jackson, you work for government, you must be either stupid, corrupt, or lazy. How's that for a warm welcome? <laughs> and and, and um, I said, well, 
I, I'm not corrupt, I do my best to be honest, but the truth is, remember this one, you can't tell everybody everything you know. You really have to know when to hold back sometimes. I'm, I'm not lazy, I work really hard. You can't get through medical school being at UCSF or anywhere else being lazy, but I feel ignorant a lot of the time. And he's sort of, what are you doing being a doctor if you're ignorant? No, doctors have to know what they don't know. And you very quickly have to know, oh man, this eye looks bad and I've gotta get an ophthalmologist in to look at it. I'm not gonna try and fix this up or suture this open lid in the child. I eventually became a pediatrician. You need to know the limits of your knowledge. So one of the things about being deep is you suddenly have a lot of respect for people that are deep in other things. That's an important piece of career advice. I ended up becoming a pediatrician at UCSF. I wanted to do neonatology, I thought, because um, it was very technical, it was very exciting, it was never bored. You were never rested, you were exhausted all the time because babies don't know the difference between night and day, but it was um, very, very meaningful work. I never liked flying on helicopters and I remember a baby extubating in the t this little tube the size of a swizzle stick straw that we were helping him breathe with pops out of his lungs and I've, I'm sitting there trying to set the thing in um, and getting the baby going again um, on the helicopter as it's vibrating, so that stuff you know, it was really where I wanted to be, but I was ready for something else. And after four years of med school and pre-med and um, you name it, and the seminary, uh, I had to do all my pre-med in about a year and a half, which was challenging. I felt like I'd been walking upstairs my whole life and I just needed to do something else. And so there was something over at CDC called, and literally I was sending home two babies that I had taken care of for about 18 weeks, and one had a brain bleed and one had a uh, delaminated intestine, and it was very difficult care. We were spending $18,000 a day on each one of these babies back then. We were gonna send them home to an 18-year-old mom that had no resources whatsoever, and the, the cognitive dissonance of this, and you know, maybe I need to think about public health. So I went off to CDC, which is a pretty, looks like a shopping center, but um, in 1975, and they assigned me to New York, which was a great job, and I enjoyed it. I had an epidemic a week, and I hate to say it, I suddenly realized this was about my father. I was doing public health because my dad died of polio. I was doing infectious disease work because in some ways I was making up holes in my own identity and personality. It was called the Epidemic Intelligence Service. I was there about six months in New York when CDC called me up and said, Dick, we're sending you to Bihar State in India, and I went off to work on smallpox eradication in India. And you can imagine, for someone that wanted to eradicate polio, and we weren't ready to do that, that the chance to eradicate smallpox was very dramatic. And I had, and I'm not making this up, I had two to 300 people working for me when I arrived, and I had bags of rupees and money, and I was, I'd never bribed anybody in my life, and I'm bragging the mayor, and bragging the police chief, and I'm closing down the city, and I'm hiring vaccinators, and I'm hiring people to watch the vaccinators, and then hiring people to watch the vaccinators who watch the vaccinators, and buying a motorcycle for the uh, village chief, because that was the only way we could get cooperation. But we eradicated smallpox. By we, I mean it was basically mostly CDC with the help of a number of other countries, particularly uh, Ukraine, you've heard of that place. Um, and the Russians helped too, but they were very difficult to work with. The Ukrainians were much easier. During that time, and partly because I grew up in New Jersey, this, uh, well, I became obsessed with environmental hazards. My mother had seen some of the women who had their faces wrought off because they were painting radium dials in East Orange, New Jersey. And I'm, there's a book called Radium Girls, and it, this was a very important thing because if you were in an aircraft flying at night, those dials needed to be lit very gently so you'd know your altitude and everything else. But they were taught to clean the brushes as if they were doing uh, very fine work on fine china. That's who taught them to do it. So they're licking this radium, which is a bone seeker, goes right to bones and it rotted out the jaws and thyroids and bones and these. Some of these young women, I don't, it's a different lecture. I do a whole one on this one, but if you took a Geiger counter and walked through the cemetery there in East Orange, your Geiger counter would go, go off 100 years later when you were walking over the graves of, the, of these young women who died young. But that was just one story. There were many of these stories in, in Jersey because it was the Garden State. 
it was absolutely the most fertile, green, lovely place you can imagine with rivers and you name it in 1880, but by the time 1950 arrived, it was the most polluted state in the country, and I'm sorry to say that. So this article, this book issue of the G pediatrics came out, oh, it was about 1973. When I tell you this, you're not gonna believe it. What do you think we were bathing the, in, the newborns in the nursery with in 1971, two, and three? We were bathing them in something called Fisahex hexachlorobenzene. Now, if you learn it, nothing else in environmental health, if you stick a halogen onto an organic molecule, it's not a good idea. You stick fluorine on chlorine, bromine, Mother Nature doesn't know how to break these bonds very effectively, and they stay around forever, they bioconcentrate, they move up the food chain. What we discovered, not we, but the French discovered that babies that were bathed in physohex were having lacunae in their brains. Lacuna is like, means a lake in Italian. They're having uh, s what they look like cysts in the brains of these children from the physohex. Of course, we immediately stopped using this worldwide, but it was a huge scandal. And day after day, there was some new chemical, DDT, killing off the pelicans, on and on and on. And very good reason to think it was probably affecting humans, too. Um, and I thought, well, you know, I'm going to do this because I'm a Jersey guy and I'm worried about early life. So I'm going to talk a little bit about pesticides because by the, when I came back to California, I had fallen in love with um, Joan, who uh, I knew out here, and we, um, I came back to California, and, and the job that was open was to be the pesticide doctor in environmental health. Well, I didn't really know much about pesticides. I'm a pediatrician, but I took it because, A, it was close to the family, and I had a couple brothers there then, and, um, but it turns out that I fell in love with pesticides. Sounds really stupid. They're intrinsically interesting. I mean, they're used because they're poison. They're toxic. That's why we use them. But wait till you hear more about them. There are about 10,000 products that are sold as pesticides, about 1,000 active ingredients. You'll see that in a little. And these active ingredients are sometimes mixed together. So you, this product may have three active ingredients plus three inert ingredients. Be forewarned, if the label on your Roundup says inert ingredients, that means it's inert in terms of killing the pest of interest. So if, if you're dichlorovos and you're gonna use it to kill insects, but it also cracks chromosomes in other species, that was considered inert. Oh, sorry. And they're used in amazing proximity to where people live. So this fellow is spraying to get rid of grubs in the front lawn, and then they, you know, they put, nowadays they put a little sign out that says, don't roll around naked on the lawn. <laughs> you, you know that? And um, they, it actually doesn't say that. It says, keep off. And every three-year-old and every dog that goes by knows how to read that sign that says, keep off. But the other reality, and this is a reality of environmental health, is it's always about big money and big, powerful political interests. And I had, been, I had made friends with the doctor that took care of Cesar Chavez, uh, Marianne Moses, and I was very interested in the terrible working conditions that farm workers are being put in. Probably the worst job you can have as a farm worker, even though it's not as hot in Ventura County, what do you think it might be? What harvesting job do you think would be the job that I suspect none of us would ever want? And some of you probably have parents or grandparents that had this job. Strawberries. What crop? Strawberries. You got it. Say why, please. High pesticides. So exactly right. And I should have you have name tags because you're, you've re really hit the nail on the head. <clears throat> harvesting strawberries, can you, I, I couldn't handle even as a young man being bent over three hours a day, four hours a day, picking a crop all day long. And you're paid for piecework, so if you're going slow, you're paid even less. And if you, they didn't have too many strawberries in the Central Valley, but it's 100 degrees in the Central Valley a lot of the time, so now you're doing it. The most pesticided crop of all are the, re, are the really soft ones. So strawberries are number one, but then peaches, 
apricots, there are a whole bunch of, and a lot of fungicide as well. By the way, fungicides are considered pesticides, disinfectants are considered pesticides, herbicides are considered pesticides. The reason that's important is they have to pay a, ta a tax on them when they're used, and they have to record, back then they didn't have to record what they were using. That's a lot of money. $50 billion, it's only 2% of the California economy. Back then it was about 10% of the California economy. But California has grown to be about the eighth, no, the sixth uh, most economically favored country in the world, if you think of it as a separate country. About a third of all the nation's vegetables, two thirds of its fruit and nuts, and 90% of the strawberries. And I'll give you these slides, there won't be any quiz on this, but it's totally interesting to see all the things that are grown. In fact, here it is. How many, who's, who's driven up Highway 5 to the Bay Area? You, I bet you all have. Um, it used to be a kind of nice drive. Now it seems to be one truck after another coming up from the port of Los Angeles, and they're all going 85 miles an hour. I find it very nerve-wracking driving. But how many of you remember driving past Harris Ranch? Tell me about Harris Ranch. That's California. Say again? It is the best. Be does it smell good? <laughs> As they say, it smells like money. Yeah. Um, in fact, one of my students last year called it Cowschwitz because they're fat fattening up about 10,000 cattle a week and they're feeding them large amounts of corn um, and other grains, but particularly corn because there's a lot of fat and it's easy to buy corn because it's really cheap. Um, and they're then hauled off to slatter at the other. The number one crop in the United States is um, in California are dairy products. Grapes, you know what those go into. Back when I was young, cotton was the biggest crop of all. And how come there's no cotton on this list? Turns out the climate is hotter. It actually should be better for cotton. But what happened is the first year they were using malathion and, then, and carbaryl, and then they had to go to dichlorovos, and then they had to go thion, and then they had, pretty soon they were spending more money on the pesticides because they were developing resistant insects. So the pink bollworm, somebody joked, could sit there and drink parathion and not be affected by it. And it was called the pestis, pesticide treadmill. Any of you that have any medical background, does this sound familiar to anything else you might think of in medicine? Antibiotics, right? When I was a young doc, we used to joke you could uncork the penicillin uh, ampule in the patient's room that had pneumonia, and you could cure them. That, we, that wasn't really true, but it, the organism, pneumococcus organism, was so sensitive to penicillin. Now we're on third and fourth generation cephalosporins to treat pneumonia. So we've had the same antibiotic treadmill that we've had in pesticides and vice versa. As you drive up Highway 5, you see these mountains, these brown mountains over to the side of the road on the east side. Those are almond hell hulls. We export more almonds, and most of it goes overseas, but it's a huge business. And these depend heavily on pollinators, and I'll come back to that in a minute. In other words, basically bees or variants of bees pollinating. There are a lot of jobs in agriculture and in pesticide work that are fairly dangerous. What do you think might be a danger, I don't know your name, but what do you think might be a danger of this person who's working at a flagger telling the crop duster, do this row, and then zoom around and go back down, do the next row, and runs to the next row so he can fly back again. What might be some dangers of this job? <laughs> hmm? Yes, I think flying under high voltage wires driving with your knees, turning off the nozzles, and making a turn is probably not, a, your insurance company's not happy about this. But also, and actually this person gets a certain amount of chemical exposure. The guy that gets more is the guy that loads the plane and puts the stuff in because if they spill anything and they get that on their skin. The flagger gets a fair amount, and often they're young women that are flaggers, you know, working a summer job or something else. So, turned out that a lot of the data on the chemicals that were being used were phony. They had been falsified. And so the files on the toxicology of all these chemicals were sitting in the Department of Food and Agriculture. 
why would pesticides be in food and ag and not an environmental agency? <laughs> He's a scientist, I can tell. <laughs> regulatory capture. This is worth writing down. What the hell is he talking about, regulatory capture? You want to take a guess what I mean? Hmm? Who regulates doctors in this state, the Board of Medical Quality Assurance? Who's on the board? Who regulates cosmetologists? Who's on the board? Who ra rates structural pest control operators? You know, the rose man, the guy that crawls into your house spraying stuff. If you're being regulated by somebody, you spend a lot of money hiring people to be on those boards to make sure that you can keep control over it. So the Department of Food and Agriculture, was charged to grow more food and agriculture and keep the economy going, is regulating pesticides, not environment and not health. And the data were all trade secrets, so you wouldn't know it anyway. This is important. This man is, even if you bought very high quality conventional food, this person's getting a thousand times the chemical exposure that you are. And it's partly because the chemicals, a lot of them are topical. They're on the outside of the leaves, and the insect lands on it, the insect dies. But um, the most common illnesses associated with, agri uh, with pesticides, and this is a skin burn the man got from the inert ingredient in propergite. Um, or dermatologic illnesses, but if they get enough of some of these chemicals, they develop pinpoint pupils and vomiting and dizziness and will pass out and high body temperatures and even die sometimes, and I don't have time to go into some of those stories. I always have this idea that if I'm growing something, it looks like it's you know, out there in the field and it's mother nature, but these are industrial facilities, these agricultural sites, and the amount of fumigants that we're using, what the hell is a fumigant? It's poison gas. Each acre, when they're using methyl bromide, got 350 pounds of methyl bromide. You took one sniff of it, you'd die, but it's shanked into the soil and it kills everything in there, all the bacteria, all the germs, all the worms, you name it. And it's basically, you've created a sterile greenhouse, sterile soil greenhouse, which you then irrigate. And this was a flower place, and, but uh, it almost doesn't matter. The slide may be slightly out of order, but Adding to all of this, if you're poor and you don't have enough water and you don't have access to reasonable care, here's Metacystoc's old container and the children are staying cool on a hot day. Um, Lonnie Silver took it. So we had, a, we had a number of pesticide illnesses and I and my colleagues, I don't speak very good Spanish, we'd show up and oh, you know, 100 people were out there in the field and they were all vomiting and 20 of them got to the hospital and they were had headaches and they weren't going, weren't functioning at all. And we'd say, well, um, we'd see them in the hospital. Who were you working for? I don't know, the labor contractor picked me up. What were the chemicals there? Oh, they were yellow and brown and some of them smelled bad and some of them made my skin burn. And we'd go to the grower and they'd say, what are you using? And they'd say, get the hell out of here. I don't have to talk to you. Um, and it was, oh, I'm not making any of this up. This is all true. And we had no way of measuring what was inside people, biomonitoring, actually figuring out what was inside the people, especially if you're now arriving there days late. And the laboratory methods were barely developed to measure what's in an apple, not to really measure what was in a human being. There's something else in this picture that interested me as the pediatrician. What do you think? Yeah, there's at least two or three kids there. This is a very difficult issue because you're poor, there's no daycare, and there's no childcare. You're being paid for piecework. Frankly, the child's probably better off in the field with you, but believe me, those chemical levels aren't being allowed on the basis of protecting children. Sorry. The slide doesn't fit perfectly, but when I talk to people along the coast who are more prosperous and have beautiful salad bowls and everything else, in general, they don't care. They really care about environmental exposures. They can spend extra money for organic, but they don't really care very much about the people who are most exposed. So if I forget to say this later, I'm gonna say it now. The best reason to buy organic is to protect the farm workers and the planet. 
because when you do that, they can't, it's very easy to find the chemicals on whatever they're spraying. So by buying organic, you're really reducing the loading of the hazards. And it does cost more, but um, you know, I'm at the point in life where I can afford it, but it's, um, it is the best reason. And I, I don't think it's good for you, but it, proving it's bad for you is a lot more difficult to eat food that's not organic. Important slide. Remember that nasty guy that told me I was corrupt, stupid, and lazy? I said to him, sir, and he said, you're just pushing the nanny state. You're just telling people what they can do and can't do and smoke and wear seat belts. They're really awful. And I said, well, actually, the purpose of public health is what? This has to be on the exam, Christine. I know. The purpose of public health is to assure the conditions where people can be healthy. This is environmental health. We're not forcing people to stop smoking, but we're gonna make it illegal to smoke in, in public places, and um, a lot of rentals now you can't smoke, and it's much easier to have no burden of tobacco in you than it was 30 years ago. I sidebar story, but I love telling this one. My, because I was from Jersey, I put the three, I took the three boys, we ba went back to Jersey for, go to the Jersey Shore one summer, my California wife goes, why do you want to go to the Jersey Shore when you got beautiful beaches in California? I don't want to go to beaches, I just freeze here, I want to go to the Jersey Shore. And this is before I really liked Bruce Springsteen. Mm -hmm. And, um, but we flew back and forth, but we got stuck, we got bumped on a flight and we we're stuck in the smoking thing. So I'm telling the son now, he's 30 years old, oh, we were back in the smoking area and we flew to Jersey and he goes, Dad, come on, people didn't smoke on airplanes. He just thought it was the stupidest thing he'd ever heard, and he was right, it was stupid, but believe me, it was true. Important slide. If you set the tolerance level based upon me sitting clothed on the couch, eating an old adult's diet, by tolerances I mean the chemical, allowable chemical levels in food based on someone like me, do you think we'd be protecting a child that breathes three to five times as much as I do and eats three to five times as much as I do, eats very differently? Babies actually eat 20 times the apple and apple products that a, someone like I would eat. I mean, there's a lot of apple juice and other kinds of sauces and stuff. And, um, and you know, back then, rolling around naked on the floor, n none of you would do it in public, but in truth, um, it would be something that babies would do. Lots of skin surface, three times the skin surface for every pound of body weight. So beginning to set the standards to protect a child, what would that mean? And think about this. If I set the standards to protect children, how does that change the standards? What do you think? Does it make them more lenient? You, they can't, no, if you're protecting a child who's going to absorb on, on a ratio maybe 10 times as much as an adult does because of behavior and diet and skin surface area, you then have to make the allowable limits for everybody 10 times less. So that has these upstream ripples. By the way, if they have a six freight cars filled with very valuable um, avocados and they find one box that's over the top limit, they condemn the whole thing, and that could be millions of dollars. So they're ve the producers are very scrupulous about making sure they're below the tolerances. And so we begin to ratchet down the tolerances to protect kids. It completely changes agriculture in the United States. So I wrote a bill, um, and there's a piece of advice about your careers. Join advocacy organizations, join professional organizations. I joined the Academy of Pediatrics. We began to write policy briefs about protecting kids from air pollution, asthma, lead poisoning, um, susceptibility of radiation effects. And we introduced a bill in the early 80s to track pesticides and fill the data gaps. And it was sent by Willie Brown to the Agriculture Committee. How well do you think this nice little pediatrician bill did in front of the Ag Committee? <laughs> I, Mr. Speaker, will the gentleman from small firearms yield the floor to the gentleman from big tobacco? You know, and as in all humor underneath it is a reality that is kind of painful. So of course the bill was killed in a microsecond. So we rewrote it again. This time it was double referred to the Health Committee and the Ag Committee, Agriculture Committee. 
It passed the health committee on the first round. Everybody said, well, this is common sense. We should do it. Went to the ag committee, and, and they didn't vote. They put it over. The second time, they put it over. The third time, I'm really worried about this. We're not going to get this bill through. And, and we had tried two or three times at this point. When I got a call from UCLA, the intensive care nursery, one of the docs there was a friend of mine. She said, Dick, we have a child with tetramelia, absence of the arms and legs. And she was poisoned as a farm worker early in her pregnancy. And we went down to try and investigate. At the time sequence slightly off, but we went down to investigate. Didn't know what she was exposed to, picked up by a labor contractor, really didn't know what made her sick. Yellow powder, brown powder, something that smelled bad. And there was no residue of any chemical in this baby, but the timing of her poisoning was roughly about right. It was about 30 days gestation where the limb buds are coming out. And um, this little boy, along with the Academy of Pediatrics and the environmentalists and the farm workers showed up at that hearing along with three or four TV stations. And they voted yes on the bill. And we got the bill through to fill the data gaps on pesticides in California. And what happens if they fill the data gaps on pesticides? It took a couple years to do it. If they fill them in California, what happens nationally? They have to disclose nationally. That's right. They give it to EPA. So EPA is looking at them. Well, God, they banned this in California. This stuff is terrible. We won't even start. There are many other stories like this. And so California would ban it. As soon as the U.S. would ban it. And then right after that, the national, the national agri international agricultural organization would ban it as well. So little California, and you know this is true with air pollution laws, it's one of the things Trump is working very hard to kill is California's ability to have independent, more stringent environmental regulations. If I don't get to say this at the end, this is the big takeaway and, and why I think environmental health is one of the most interesting things you can do. Because if you, you've got to learn toxicology, you've got to learn some epidemiology, you've got to learn physiology, but you also have to begin to learn economics, public policy, and even a certain amount of politics. Because whenever there's a lot of money, there's a lot of politics. And there's always a lot of money in this kind of thing. I then began to argue we need to have an ability to track diseases. And with a birth defects registry, and I'm, I'm running out of time, but we put a birth defects registry in place. Jerry Brown, round one, actually signed this law into place, and we ended up doing dozens of studies that were probably in some ways even more important than the pesticide studies. You know, medicines that were given to women with eclampsia that would stop rapid uh, deliveries, for example, turned out to actually prevent a whole series of other diseases, um, and folic acid and other things. But, where I'm going, the big takeaway here is by fusing environmental concerns and health concerns, we had a policy impact we wouldn't have with each one of us arriving separately and having a separate message. And then we had this awful cancer cluster in a town called McFarland and also one in another town, and we brought together an advisory committee and I t very s distinguished people from all the major universities and elsewhere, and we explained, well, we actually don't know where pesticides are used. Nobody has to record what they're using. And um, out of this, we, out of the cancer cluster investigation, this is a two years worth of work, we got full reporting. Every pesticide that's used in California commercially has to be reported. That's been a gold mine for researchers and the work going down, on, down the hall on uh, Parkinson's disease and pesticides comes out of those data use reports. And Brenda Ashkenazi's work at Berkeley on birth defects and neuro, uh, neurologic diseases, even in teenagers who were heavily exposed as, as babies, um, that has come out of this full measurement. And I talk about action, uh, people, partners, and all this. The other thing that's important is policy. And I know that sounds rather vague, but to turn something from, oh yeah, it doesn't matter, to no, it's not acceptable to have these things. And then to begin to write laws that capture what's acceptable and what's not. And this big step was, um, Jane, you sort of stumbled when you were talking about the National Academy of Science. This is the National, National Academy of Sciences has three elements, engineering, sciences, pure, and then medicine. 
And I've been spending all week last week battling with the Academy of Medicine because I'm telling them they need to be much more activist about speaking to climate change. And they keep saying, we're not supposed to be advocates. I said, no, no, doctors are supposed to look at the d disease disorder, uh, make an assessment, make a recommendation. That's not, that, that is part of our job as being medicine people. It's not, scientists can sit there and say, well, we need another five years to study it, but it's not okay in medicine. So here's the report from Pesticides, Risks in Children, and it says, legally set all tolerances to protect children, and I apologize, I'm jumping through these. There's a big one here. When I tell you this, it's gonna sound so obvious, it sounds stupid. They were le legally allowing 25 different chemicals that had exactly the same toxicologic effect. They're basically morphine, um, Demerol, yeah, I, I, no, they were cholinesterase inhibitors. I'm trying to say this simply. If I were to prescribe codeine, morphine, uh, Demerol, and a whole series of narcotics to somebody, and every one of them was a allowable dose, but I gave you 25 chemicals that had the exact same effect, believe me, you'd die. And so you, we were legally allowing 25 chemicals that had the same tox effect on apples, for example, or bananas, without really looking at their combined stacked up impacts. So what this finally led to, and I or alluded to this, was getting rid of a whole bunch of the chemicals. About two thirds of the chemicals were being used. And that came out of the fusion of health and environment and concern and the ability to measure and the science that goes on in environmental health. And um, 5,000 of the existing allowable limits were basically gotten rid of. And we were told for years it was fine. Half of them were thrown out saying they're not fine. About 1,200 had to be modified down. So I'm running out of time, but I went off to CDC and I, my big campaign was I gotta figure out how much is in people and I gotta push the laboratory. I gotta figure out what's in the population and I have to push N. Haynes, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, to figure out what's in our population and did this with our lab. We had about 300 people in this lab, um, about 60 mass specs, and uh, we did all the lab work. Now we're measuring five, my lab people, are measuring 500 chemicals in a thimble full of blood um, that they get from hands. You'll get a lot of blood out of a baby when you're doing a population survey. And I, again, I'm out of time. So I am going to jump past these, actually you're wrong. One of the big issues in pesticides is all those bad guys I used to know have been displaced. And here's the biggest, baddest actor that's out there right now, um, these Novichuk agents. This is the stuff that poisoned the guy, the father and daughter in Salisbury, England. And the Russians denied they even were making this stuff. We kind of knew it, we, had, we devised methods to be able to analyze for it. So it was basically our labs that said, yeah, we know this is it. Russians then said, well, how could you know what it is? You're not legally allowed to do it because it's banned under the Chemical Weapons Treaty. Well, we didn't make it as a weapon, we made it as a lab standard. But these are the big ones. This is the stuff that's killing the bees. You can put one of these corn kernels that are treated with neonicotinoids in the ground Three months later, you've got a corn stalk 18, eight feet high with corn tassels and silk all over it. And if a butterfly lands on that silk, they die. That's how durable and toxic these chemicals are. So what happens to all the monarch butterflies that are flying over a thousand miles of the Midwest with corn everywhere treated with this stuff? And I don't have time to go through the story, but again, it has environmental impacts. And I, I have to think that if it's bad for Monarch butterflies, it's bad for my kid's childhood because I can't see monarch butterflies, but it's also bad for human happiness and it's bad for our brains. And this is the sales of these chemicals just taking off like a rocket ship up to 2014. So things have really changed since then and I have four minutes left. I was gonna teach you how to be effective politically. You'll have to bring me back. Actually, yes. can I, will you give me four, will you give me five minutes to teach you, talk about being effective politically? This sounds silly, and if you listen to me, I talk differently from the real scientists in this department and this school. 
because I had to learn to say things that were complicated, like really don't allow things that are carcinogens, teratogens, um, et cetera, et cetera, and make sure the tolerances meet all. Yeah, I had to learn to speak in ways that anybody could understand. By the way, pediatrics is wonderful training for that. Um, this sounds obvious. I must have said this three times at a hearing in front of Senator Kennedy and the Senate Ag Committee. Children are not little adults. When you're setting standards, children are not a little. It sounds perfectly obvious. By the end of it, it had become common sense for the whole committee. And it, but that didn't, that took months to really think about how do I convey that message in a powerful way. Rather than talking about LD50s and low dose exposures and LD10s and everything else. If it's safe for children, it's probably safer for everyone. It's true, right? Because they're growing and their cells are dividing and they absorb better and fill the data gaps. I'm a bad example of this, but communication is at least 50% listening. Over and over again, I would deal with government agencies and they would hire some public relations person to go out and talk nonsense. And one of the things I admired so much about Barack Obama is he was a very good listener before he would begin to speak. And in your career, listen, listen, listen. And by the way, you never communicate enough. And the whole principle of advertising, when we put the same stupid ad on 50 times during the World Series, it is so that becomes part of your identity. You know this stuff. By the way, did you ever notice they never try and sell anything that's good for you? <laughs> practice, practice, rehearse out loud. So if you have to give a talk, and this is really painful, but I did a four hour PBS series. It's really painful to stand in front of a camera and speak into that dark lens and go, oh my God, my, my eyes are all over the place. I look shifty. Oh my God, you know. Every time I say the word pop, it goes Pop. I have to like learn how to do, how to not pop my peas. And you, this stuff's easy to learn, but you can't just walk up and do it. You have to actually practice. And so when my son was, my son's now a doc at CDC, but when he was an un undergrad, I said, Brent, you need to take a public speaking class. He goes, why? You want to record your talk? You need to take a class. So he goes to his advisor, and Shane, it wasn't you, but it was a, a technical chemical scientist who said, what's this on your, your class list? Um, it was actually public speaking. He said, you don't need this. This is nonsense. Well, my father said I should do it. Parents don't know anything. Don't take it. Well. He did take it, and he said at the end of it, they would do videos every time. He goes, Dad, you can't believe how bad I was. I, I really, you, it, when you see yourself, and you, you have to love your, it, I don't mean this in a bad way, but you have to be kind to yourself as you would be to anyone else. Don't pick on yourself and become self-conscious because, frankly, none of us are as beautiful as the folks that make billion, millions making movies, you just have to sort of love yourself and be put up with who you are and be confident. Maybe this should have been with the earlier slide, but I love this one quote. It's from Constantine Brancusi, and he's done artwork. You'll see it at the Norton Simon and elsewhere. Simplicity is really hard. And, it will t and I find that writing is the best way that I can actually become simpler because it's all swirling around. When I have to sweat and write out what I want to say, I really become simpler and simpler. The media is important. Uh, social media I don't know as much about, but, uh, and I'll defer that one to you. But the other one is the power of a story. So I was at the Academy of Sciences, right there on the mall in Washington, D.C., looking out at the statue of Einstein underneath the, f the portrait of Lincoln, because he charted the place 150 years ago. Um, and I started out my talk about saying the Academy is, National Academy of Medicine is not doing enough about cl uh, climate and health. We're being too passive, we're being too scientific, we gotta be more medical. And then I started with this story. When I first arrived at CDC, I got a call a few months there that there were freezer trucks lined up in the heat wave outside of the morgue in Chicago. And I tell you, it is really unnerving when you see freezer truck after freezer truck filled with corpses. Um, and everybody, oh, oh, this heat thing, yeah, I guess this is important. It, it, it was much more graphic than if I just cited statistics. And so a good story goes a long way. People never forget the stories. 
I've already talked about having friends, but I'll just leave Kiwanis and Rotary. Now that sounds pretty corny. That's for really old people, war babies. Kiwanis, the people behind huge efforts to get rid of micronutrient malnutrition, iodine malnutrition, folic acid malnutrition, and they've done a wonderful job world, worldwide. Rotary, Rotary, God bless them, has put a billion and a half dollars in donations into the eradication of polio worldwide. And it isn't just the money because they've gotten a lot of other countries, Rotary members are in the government and elsewhere. Rotary has done a good job. So if you get an invitation, you got to play the minor leagues before you get up at, at the World Series and have people throwing hard balls 100 miles an hour at you. And you, any chance you can go and do a talk, go do it. And the more scared you are, the more you should go do it. <laughs> Some reflections on being leaders. Um, a pretty good leader, a superb leader, and a terrible leader, murderer. Um, it, what is leadership? What you think? Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> in getting people to come to a common consensus and like keep That's good. connection together. So getting people to come to a common, I love it. There, most people that are so-called leaders think it's the art of getting people to, to do what you want them to do. Good. You're nodding your head no, and you're right. Leadership is the art of getting people to want to do what you want them to do. And remember about the listening, and you really have got to incorporate their needs. Actually, uh, why am I talking about leadership in this class? You are in this superb school with wonderful opportunities and your youth and your brains, and it's not okay to simply be a scientist. It's not okay to be a functionary only. You have to become a leader. My God, we're desperate for good leadership as the society and the